So good evening. Um, I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm currently a professor and head of the Department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytic Studies at the University of Essex. I'm so, so pleased to see so many of you here with us tonight to celebrate this landmark event. I can see colleagues from our Jungian and post-Jungian community of scholars and clinicians, some very esteemed guests. Uh, and within that, I include all our students as well, because you are our colleagues, you are our fellow researchers, so welcome. I see colleagues from Refugee Care, colleagues from our Department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytic Studies, colleagues from across the university and beyond. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I just want to say a few words about the pioneering Jungian Studies program and pathways that were started here at Essex by Renos and Andrew, how central these programs are to the growth of this department and why this lecture series is both timely and necessary. Now, many of you may know that both Renos and Andrew were named the first professors of analytical psychology in the mid 1990s. And in the first instance, these two strategic posts were supported by our friends and colleagues at the Society of Analytical Psychology. Together, Renos and Andrew created our MA Jungian and Post Jungian Studies, which was first launched in 1997. This was such an innovation at the time, being the only MA level course dedicated to Jungian and Post Jungian Studies in Europe, and one of only a small handful around the world. Together, Renos and Andrew steered the degree through the troubled waters of higher education in the UK, revising, renewing, and reworking the program to suit the needs of a rapidly changing environment. During the pandemic, we adjusted and learned from the experience and launched our online version of MAJ to adapt to the changing circumstances in which people learn and want to engage in this particular course. And I'm very pleased to report to everyone that both versions of the degree under Mark's astute leadership are absolutely thriving. So both the campus-based version and the online version. The diversification of our delivery ensured the continued vitality of the program, that it continues to contribute to a department's agenda and that it will continue as a going concern for many, many years to come. And as we speak, the MAJ team are hard at work to introduce further innovations to the program to ensure it remains a global leader in our multifaceted and multidisciplinary field. I'm also very pleased to report that Jungian and post-Jungian content forms a significant part of our BA psychosocial and psychoanalytic studies. And let's not forget the contributions our esteemed founders have made uh, to nurture the future academics in this field and beyond. So just looking within our current staff team uh, who specialize in Jungian and post Jungian studies, there's eight of us all together. So phenomenal number, eight of us. Six have had a previous affiliation with Essex. Five of us have completed our PhDs here. So who are we very briefly? Soon after Renos's and Andrew's appointment, Professor Roderick Main was added to the team, followed by myself, uh, Dr. Mark Saban, Dr. David Henderson, Dr. Ann Addison, Dr. Orshwia Lukash, and we're very pleased to announce that Dr. Monica Lucci has joined us as well. So welcome, Monica. The history of Jungian and post-Jungian studies at Essex is an inspiring one. It has made a significant contribution to the life of PPS. It's played a vital, pivotal role in our growth from center to department and remains one of the centerpieces of PPS as we march forward in our ambition to becoming the leading department of psychosocial and psychoanalytic studies, both nationally and internationally. With such a clear vision in mind, it would be remiss of us not to honor and celebrate the contributions Jungian and post-Jungian studies have made not only to the department, but to the wider interdisciplinary field of psychosocial and psychoanalytic studies. Now, the credit for this initiative, uh, for this lecture series, uh, really belongs to Dr. Chris Nicholson. So this was first started under his leadership, um, but because of the timing, the pandemic, and other factors, 
it's taken a bit longer than we had hoped to launch this event. But we're here, and that's the important thing. The lecture series is devoted to exploring the myriad of ways in which Jungian ideas have been critically assessed and expanded into diverse areas of interest and expertise. The series celebrates the multidisciplinary ethos of Jungian and post-Jungian approaches and seeks to highlight the groundbreaking contributions colleagues have made to clinical practice and academic research. This annual event further reasserts the department's place as a center of excellence and destination of choice when it comes to thinking critically about analytical psychology, where colleagues and students alike can benefit from diverse and world-class specialization. And with this in mind, who better than our very own esteemed professor, Renos Papadopoulos, to deliver our inaugural C.G. Young Lecture. I will now hand over to my colleague, Dr. Mark Saban, who is also the course director of MAJ, to introduce Renos. Mark? Thank you very much, Kevin. Yeah, I am uh, truly delighted uh, to be able to introduce uh, to you, Professor Renos Papadopoulos, today. Not only has his work been an important resource for me, personally, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But I believe his writings, and here I'm not focusing uh, so much on the refugee work, which has rightly been honoured many times by many people, but specifically on the Jungian, or should I say post-Jungian writings, these texts are, I think, seminal for Jungian studies for several crucial reasons. Firstly, he is not and has never been aligned with any particular interest group within analytical psychology, within the spectrum. From the beginning, he's been his own man. Now, Renos arrived a little too late to be included in Andrew Samuel's Jung and the Post-Jungians, but the fact is that Andrew would have found it impossible to classify him in the way he does everyone else as either developmental, classical, or archetypal. Renos has cleverly avoided this kind of typecasting. And this originality is important because it's enabled him to simply write what he wants to write, without feeling obliged to indulge in sterile internecine polemics. And as a result, and this is my second point, his writings possess both clarity and rigor. But, and I think this is important, he manages to achieve this without sacrificing psychological depth or losing touch with what Hillman would have called soul. For example, it's no small thing to do what he does in his paper on Jung's epistemology and methodology, both of which Jung would probably have denied he had, to illuminate and excavate Jung's approach, but without becoming reductive or simultaneously jettisoning that ambiguity which is so core to Jung. And moreover, this means that when he does feel the need to be constructively critical of Jung, one doesn't get the sense that some kind of desperate Oedipal attack has occurred. Now, I just want to briefly focus on two motifs in Renault's work that I personally have valued very much. First of all, his circumambulation of the theme of the other with a capital O. I can't tell you how pleased I was to discover online Renault's 1980 PhD thesis from the University of Cape Town, which is entitled The Dialectic of the Other. I think this is definitely one of the most important unpublished works in the post jungian canon. Renos returns to this core theme in 1991 with Jung and the concept of the other, and then again 10 years later with the other other, when the exotic other subjugates the familiar other. But these, these really are just the papers in which he specifically names the theme. In truth, it is woven inextricably throughout all his work. And this theme, the other, is not only rooted firmly in Jung, but it also provides a lens through which, to use the title of one of Renos's own papers, to perform an extending of Jungian psychology. Now, the second motif I want to draw attention to emerges, I think, out of and is bound up with the first. In all his writings, he returns again and again to the problematic way in which Jung psychology has become trapped in a narrowly individual, intrapsychic way of thinking about psychology. Renos returns to this problem repeatedly, 
and provides in different ways, both theoretical and practical possibilities for transforming it in the direction of the interactional, the transpersonal and the collective. We can see this in his work on family therapy, work on refugees, the Umwelt, numerous other examples of what he has described as interventions outside the consulting room. And in this way, Renos has made what I consider to be a uniquely important contribution to the extension of Jungian psychology into what we might call the psychosocial. Now, Renos's writings on both these intertwined themes have been a personal inspiration for me and my work, and I would like to express my gratitude for that. But more generally, I want to thank him for setting such a good example as an academic, a clinician, and as an all-round post-Jungian. But I think that's enough from me. I think it's time to hear from the man himself. So uh, over to you, Renos. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I, I am absolutely speechless. Thank you very much. I did not expect that. Uh, I thought that you would say a couple of things and we would move on. But I'm really very, very grateful that uh, you said all those things. I am very um, thankful, grateful, honored, and humbled that the department has uh, um, asked me to give the first uh, uh, lecture of this uh, nature. And uh, <clears throat> um, I, I really look forward to engaging with you. The difficulty is that, of course, um, within the framework of this lecture, it's difficult to have uh, so much interaction, but I hope that that will be the beginning of many more interactions. There are, of course, some limitations today because of time, but also it's difficult for me to, at, to pitch it at, at a specific level because here, um, this uh, event is attended by scholars far more knowledgeable and worthy than me, um, as well as uh, scholar, younger people whose uh, uh, explorations in Jung are uh, in, in their earlier stages. So it's very difficult to sort of uh, pitch it at a different level. But nevertheless, here I'll, I'll, I'll plunge into this and uh, let's see how it goes. So um, I'm going to be sharing my, uh, <clears throat> my screen with you. Um, and uh, um, I'm aware that we lost a lot of time um, no, it wasn't. I mean, um, I feel embarrassed that I heard all those things. But anyway, uh, let's move on. Um, my title <clears throat> um, is uh, The Relevance or Irrelevance of Jungian Theories in Academic Contexts. And what I mean by this is, first of all, I want to question what are Jungian theories? Are Jungian theories exactly only what he said and wrote? Um, or also what he implied by what he uh, wrote? And also um, something else, what avenues do they open up by what he you wrote and uh, or say and he did not do? And then what do I mean by academic context? I mean, not only what happens in universities, but also in terms of wider sc academic scholarship, which is characterized by basically locating a subject of investigation in wider relevant contexts and advancing plausible academic arguments. And so the evidence in this academic context is not some kind of um, uh, crystal clear proof, but uh, uh, the, by the selection and of, the, of, the, of the evidence that one is de develops. So if, if, if you were expecting for me to give you now a list of what is relevant and what is irrelevant, I'm going to disappoint you. No. I'm not going to be the arbiter of what is and what is not of relevance, but I'm interested in how we should be troubled by this question. And I'm interested in exploring the question of relevance to problematize the question of relevance. So essentially what I'm going to present is a kind of a panorama of critical reflections. And of course, I'm, they will be based um, on my own experiences and, and my own not sort of personal incidental experiences, but in the context of the fact that I've been a, a, a Jungian analyst and an academic for most of my life, uh, I mean, um, professional life. And uh, I was very blessed to teach in 
been involved and in teaching in two amazing universities, beautiful universities, also the University of Cape Town in South Africa, um, and then the University of Essex in the UK. Um, and in between, I worked a, as a clinician exclusively um, at the, in the NHS National Health Service in the United Kingdom at the Tavistock Clinic. Um, but also I was involved uh, as a member of staff of uh, universities, um, London universities like uh, University College London, uh, Birkbeck uh, uh, University of East London and Brunel. Um, so throughout my career, I've been both a clinician and, a, and an academic, and I found that it's very useful, the one informs the other, but also I think it's relevant in terms of Jung because um, Jung was combining uh, or arguing and uh, his contribution can be seen and, and validated and valued from both of these perspectives, the therapeutic and the academic discourses. So um, we need to understand the similarities and differences and the uniqueness between these two. The therapeutic clinical discourse essentially is a vocational discourse. It's an apprenticeship. You learn principles, uh, terms, and processes, but in the way they are applied in practice. Um, and of course, these are offered by training institutes, societies, groups, whatever, in different countries, these are called differently. At the university level or in academic context, the aim is to develop critical thinking where we investigate where these terms and principles and processes are investigated. You don't just simply take them for granted and see how you, you apply them, but you question them. You look at their context, you research them, you explore them. And this is what happens in universities. Of course, this relates, goes back to ancient Greeks. You know, uh, Plato and Aristotle were really very concerned about the um, differentiation between these two types of learning or these two types of knowledge, what they refer to as episteme and techni. I'm not going to go into the etymology of that, but it's interesting. Episteme simply means you put something there and you examine it. Where a techni is from TikTok, which means you give birth, you mold, you fashion. So there are two different types of, of processes here. The therapeutic <clears throat> clinical discourse, the techni, uh, refers to art, craft, discipleship. People don't simply say that I was at that university, or et cetera, but if a, a pianist or an artist said, I worked under that person. They are talking about um, learning from, uh, from a master. Um, whereas, uh, and, and, and that is related to, you know, techni, technology, and that's why we have the polytechnics. Polytechnics were uh, uh, technical institutions that uh, one would learn something to apply. As opposed to the epistemic, which is connected with academic, which is supposed to be pure or theoretical knowledge related to research and supposed to be objective, etc. Related to this inevitably are two types of assessment. Within the therapeutic clinical discourse, we have what is referred to as um, clinical judgment. Now, some people would call it subjective, but a good clinician will say to you, this is not because I've read it in a book, but this comes from my own clinical judgment. Whereas in the academic discourses, um, there are supposed to be transparent criteria or academic merit and, and, and evidence. Now, of course, the situation has been changing. I have experienced the changes in this country. Um, one of the uh, at attendants uh, asked me if I'm going to speak Greek. Presumably, you, are, you think that I am, I've, been living, I've been living in this country for 43, 44 years um, and before in South Africa. I've never lived in Greece. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Um, so <laughs> so uh, here are the stereotypes. Um, so um, my experience in the, uh, throughout has shown that actually over the years, there has been a lot of changes in terms of the connection between training groups and universities. To begin with, they are completely independent because they follow completely different learn, 
learning uh, methods and different methods of assessment. Now they have been connecting since for the last, I don't know, 20 years or so, there's been increasingly closer links between therapeutic training groups and universities. And of course, for the training groups, there have been many benefits such as raising standards, but also external validation and legitimacy. Legitimacy. A lot of people are by saying, oh, my brand of psychotherapy is taught at a university, it means that you know, it has some standing. And of course, there have been benefits for universities in so far as they are engaged increasingly in terms of their impact they have in societies. And they are not just simply abstract academics. Um, and, uh, and, and also, of course, inevitably for financial gain, certainly in the UK, the way that universities have been funded, um, um, has changed radically, so they need much more income. But these changes in the mode of university teaching and learning, of course, on the one hand, some has some advantages in terms of the cross-pollination and, and the enrichment, but also there are some there is some increasing confusion, and we need to be clear about that. What you are teaching in a, in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a training society, you cannot just simply take it and bring it into a university. No, there it needs to be questioned. It's not just simply to learn it, how it, how it has been taught by the elders. Um, and Jungian theories are at the crux of that. Jung has been struggling all his life about the legitimacy of his, uh, of his, uh, of his uh, theories and of his work in general, asking, you know, saying, well, I'm a, I'm a clinician and, he, and you know, if you want to judge me, look, what I'm doing works. Um, and other times he sort of said, no, 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 listen to what I'm saying because I, what I'm saying is theoretically valid. And he was struggling with that. Listen to his sensitivity, how he's dealing with this. In this particular quotation is, uh, he's talking about psychotherapists and he says, the psychotherapist is threatened with a conflict of duties between two diametrically opposed and mutually exclusive attitudes. The knowledge on the one hand and the understanding on the other. This conflict cannot be solved by an either or, but only by a kind of a two-way thinking, doing one thing while not losing sight of the other. These are incredibly wise words that point to amazing epistemological sensitivity. On the one hand, he tells us that they are, met, that they are diametrically opposed. On the other hand, you say, get on with it, honor both. And while you're working with the one, don't forget that the other also exists. Jung was struggling with scientific proof, but unfortunately, at that particular time, he was talking about positivistic approaches. And, and even you know, early Jungians were trying to uh, uh, validate uh, the Jungian theories with positivistic understanding of science. And Jung himself, in his writings, is talking about the sharp dichotomy between natural sciences and humanities. That dichotomy is obvious. I was involved in that going back to the 70s when I was uh, teaching at the University of Cape Town, I was involved myself in trying to be scientific Jungian. And uh, this uh, paper, um, we are working on that in the 70s, it was published in 83. Um, you will not believe it. I urge you to go and have a look at that. I mean, I just looked at that and I, I was cringing with embarrassment on one hand and also with pride on the other, because I then, you know, in those days, basically we tried to look at, we had a sleep laboratory in the department of psychology at the University of Cape Town with EEG, EEG machines and everything, electrogravanic reflexes and everything. And we had uh, people, um, first year students, of course, and we had uh, experimental and control groups. And we are looking at the archetypal content of dreams and trying to see the EEG, I mean, ingeniously crazy you know, <laughs> designs, but you know, um, um, 
attempts to somehow val validate and legitimize the Jungian theories. We don't need to do that anymore. Um, um, returning to the same, uh, the same slide, since Jung, there is an emergence of, uh, of social sciences with a remarkable range of methodologies and epistemologies, far more conducive to Jungian, to Jungian psychology, such as narrative epistemologies, feminist epistemologies, action epistemologies, ethnographic epistemologies, etc. So the, the other, we have many challenges in relation to Jungian approach. Are we talking about the person or the field? Of course, there is no obvious and easy distinction. How much is the person? How much is the field? Um, there are some advantages and disadvantages in connecting the person with the field. Um, and that should be the su subject matter of academic investigation. In other words, let somebody advance a, an argument why this is of relevance because Jung did this, et cetera, et cetera, in his own life. Um, but then we need to actually question, I mean, what is a Jungian field? Is there a Jungian field or is there the Jungian field? Um, and where does it start? Is it before Jung? In other words, the uh, 19th century uh, associationist movement in Germany or whatever. Um, this is the Jung himself after Jung or wider context. What is Jungian? And who is Jungian? Um, and of course, I'm not interested in the polemics as to whether somebody says I'm a Jungian or, or I'm more Jungian than you, or I'm 20 grams or 20 percentage more than Jungian than you, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in terms of, you know, how much of what Jung was saying was actually Jungian? How much of what Jung was saying was actually Jungian? And of course, what do we mean by Jungian? So we need to be troubled by these questions. Is there a one and coherent Jungian uh, system? Do we have, I mean, is Jung just simply a clear black and white image or is it a mosaic, colorful mosaic of different images of different parts of Jung? And I would argue that that is the latter. There isn't any one coherent, clear, clear Jung. Um, by the way, this is an image that one of my daughters who's a painter painted it and the other daughter who uh, deals with computers uh, messed it up uh, um, digitally. And that has been used widely by the University of Essex to refer to our Jungian studies. Um, so um, we need to keep on looking at the challenges that the Jungian uh, uh, approach uh, presents. For example, here I'm enumerating um, some of the uh, oops, some of the um, themes that Jung has dealt with: trauma, families, word association typology, complexes, etc. all of these things that we all know. Are all of these things Jungians? For example, I really challenge you, think seriously. Look at, go back into the collected works. Jung uses the word trauma exclusively to refer to a Freudian understanding of trauma. At no, in no way Jung says, this is my understanding of trauma. He doesn't. Wherever you see trauma is, you, is Freudian trauma. So do we take that actually the, 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 the Jungian writings about trauma are Jungian? No, they are Freudian. Because when he moved on, whatever he refers to what you and I call trauma, he did not use the word trauma. And this is something that I'm going to um, discuss uh, later. Um, Jung worked with families and he abandoned it. But I picked it up and I think there is a lot of fruitful stuff there. He didn't think that it was Jungian. The majority of people in Jungian trainings, they don't include it. This is an example for me. I don't, we don't have time to go through all of that. To pause and question, what is Jungian from Jung? Above all, we should not forget what Jung time and again, time and again, bombards us with saying, I have set up neither a system nor a general theory, but have merely postulated formulated auxiliary concepts to serve me as tools. He keeps on saying that. Do we say, 
oh no, he was actually modest, but actually he does. And we construct this system. Or do we take him to his word? I think we should take him to his word. That's my argument, but let's discuss it. Listen to this. He's saying that my concept of the archetype or of psychic energy is only an auxiliary idea which can be exchanged at any time for a better formula. Do you understand what he's saying? Can you imagine that some Jungian group now all of a sudden says, we don't use the word for uh, 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 archetype because we found something else? There will be civil wars in those societies. We have wedded so much to that word. There, Jungian says, oh, it's a mere auxiliary idea. Change it, no problem. And he tells us why. We know that in the mind of the creator of new ideas, things are much more fluid and flexible than they are in the minds of his followers. They do not possess his vitality. The followers do not possess the, the, the creator's vitality. And they make up for, his, for this deficiency by a dogmatical allegiance. In other words, followers, they don't understand the complexity and they hold on to a dogma in exactly the same way as their opponents who, like them, cling to the dead letter because they cannot grasp his living content. You see, Jung is equating the followers and the opponents in the same category in so far as they hold on to the dead letter rather than seeing the vitality of a creation. So much so as we know that it is said um, that actually when the, we know that he did not want a, 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 uh, um, a, an institute to be founded uh, in, in his, uh, for, for his psychology, he called it a mausoleum. Franz Jung told me once, he used that word mausoleum. I don't want a mausoleum. Um, and it is said that he said that my grandfather, Carl Gustav Jung, once founded a home for retarded children. Now I'm founding one for retarded adults. So, <clears throat> so all of us are the retarded adults of, uh, um, no, this is not a photograph of the retarded adults. I'm trying to move on to another theme here. I don't believe any of you know who this uh, young man here is. Uh, this young man is Josip Vissarionovich Jukashvili. Um, who is, of course, uh, Yosef uh, Vissarionovich Jukashvili, Stalin. Now, why did I mention, did I show this? Because that photograph there is when Stalin was in a religious seminary. He was training to become a priest. So are we saying that because he was becoming a priest, he was a man of God until the, at the end of his life? We're talking about transformation. Now, somebody may say, and that can be argued, and that's very interesting academic uh, debate as to whether his religious zeal moved from religion into um, communism. That's another interesting and plausible uh, idea, and that's interesting to, to discuss. And I'm going to, in order to drive my point home, I'm going to show you some other examples. Um, I don't think you know this young boxer here. This is uh, Nelson Loli Hakla Mandela, and uh, uh, he started as a, as a boxer. Um, of course, you may say that the fact that he was a boxer in his youth um, uh, helped him to develop stamina and to, and to be a fighter and all of that. But again, that is your conjecture and, and that would be an interesting point to discuss. But the man did not become, a, 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 my point is that the man did not become a boxer. And uh, these young aspiring, uh, uh, artist who was looking in Liverpool to find inspiration and all of that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if, that, if you recognize that this was actually Hitler. Uh, he, uh, he was there in 1912 in Toxteth in, in, in Liverpool um, looking for um, the latest artistic movements. Again, you may say that because he was a failed artist, etc., he be, then became a brutal dictator, etc. My last one is this one, who um, this young boy had uh, two suicidal attempts before the age of 13, and he had serious bouts of adult depression. Um, his name was Michael King, later changed it to Martin Luther King. Now uh, you may say that his own 
personal struggle with his own mental health increased his sensitivity, but um, we cannot see a linear development. So we cannot say that everything that Jung said and did um, is really of relevance. Uh, we, you need to argue for it. That's my point. Um, so the earlier activities and experiences can be defining or irrelevant or incidental, and they can be defining either in a, in a clear positive way or in a negative way. Clear positive way means that, I don't know, um, for example, if somebody's father is an alcoholic, they may never touch alcohol in their, in their lives or um, they may become alcoholics themselves. So my central argument, uh, what is central and what is incidental is that you may not have had a system, but he did have central preoccupations. And this is for me more important how we can identify certain preoccupations that uh, um, can be argued that they run through his life. And this is exactly what um, uh, Mark was referring to. <laughs> My PhD at the University of Cape Town, um, uh, writing in the 70s, um, 533 pages, I think. Uh, thank God now we don't have to mark uh, pages a PhD of that length. Now there is a length to uh, limit to that. But anyway, um, yes, um, I was interested in trying to understand the other. Now it's a long story, and actually I have written a paper about this. Those of you who are interested about my development of why um, I identified the theme of the other in Jung, I started reading Lacan at the time, also in the mid 70s. Um, and um, um, yes, it's a long story. I don't want to go into that now. But basically, my central argument was this. Um, can we see, is there any way that it can be argued that, the, that all, most of the important Jungian theories, in effect, are a progressive reformulation of his understanding of the other. In other words, he was preoccupied by the other from the beginning of his life. And I, um, you know, in my, in, you know, in my PhD, first I developed a theory of the other in Heraclitus, Plato and Hegel, remember, academic to put it in wider context. And then in terms of his own development, I looked at um, the fire, the carved mannequin and the pebble from his imaginary games. Those of you, unfortunately, who are not familiar with that, I don't have time now to explain all of these things. But Jung, as a child, was, I said, I'm not going to explain, but I cannot leave things unexplained. <laughs> uh, basically, he, he, he experienced some very powerful way of connecting with other entities and asking himself, am I uh, this? who I think that I am, or that entity is also part of me. And that is the essential, essential question that he is having. And then later he formulated into his one and two personalities. And I would argue that his development of the theory of complex is another formulation of his theory of the other, the other as complex as I would call it, um, which is semi-autonomous parts within one personality, the other a symbol, which is um, uh, autonomous uh, entities in the collective, symbol has collective uh, uh, meaning, and then culminating to the archetype, which is both intrapsychic and collective. And the dialectic is that it is both internal and external, specific, etc., cetera, um, intrapsychic as well as societal. Jung was telling us all the time that his theoretical positions become dated and they evolve. And I want to give another example of some of his genius and some of his uh, uh, shortcomings. And I've picked up on, on, on a word that he's using four times in the collected words, the word metania. Um, or in English, they refer to it as metanoia. Um, he is writing um, 
the fourth for the the forward to the fourth edition of his symbols of transformation in 1950 and he's referring to his book in 1911 and he's saying that I've re I wrote that in in my 36th year the time is a critical one for it marks the beginning of the second half of life second half of life when metanoia or metania uh, in greek a mental transformation not infrequently occurs so he's telling us that um well don't look at this formulation that was when i was uh it was my earlier part of my development following my substantial transformation through metania i am now looking at things different and Jung does several times that. I found several, we don't have time, I've found several occasions where he tells us how his uh, uh, writings are dated. And he's pointing that actually he's thinking differently. Do we do that? Or we just take whatever we read out of context? But then he is also using the word metania in another context. And he's saying there is only one remedy for the leveling effect of all collective measures. This is about writing about uh, um, um, flying sources uh, and uh, UFOs. And that is to emphasize and increase the value of individual. The fundamental change of attitude, metania, again, is required. A real recognition of the whole man. This can only be the business of the individual and it must begin with the individual in order to be real. What he's saying now is that this change of transformation in second half of life moves a person from being a collective person to focusing more on themselves. Fine, no problem. But let's pause. This is the difficulty with you. He's taking one term, but he hasn't actually researched it sufficiently. Although he knows a little bit about the church fathers, the church fathers are talking about news, um, not referring just the mind, but also the heart. They refer to the totality of human faculties that make a biological being become a human being, a person. In Hebrew, because this is a, it's a biblical uh, term, this, uh, in Hebrew, the term is teshuvah. Teshuvah. Teshuvah means turning shuv means turning and teshuva metania which unfortunately in Greek, in, in english is 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 is, is interpreted is, is translated as repentance repentance is one of the um consequences of metania metania is a much deeper transformation what is teshuva in hebrew is the turning to become aware that God is calling me. It's an amazing concept. Is that turning? So I don't carry on anymore on my own, my own way, but I turn and I realize that God is calling me. So it establishes a different epistemological perception a different understanding of myself that now I'm part of creation, et cetera, et cetera. So it transforms in, so it becomes a little bit almost opposite to what Jung is saying superficially. Yes, I focus more on myself, but in a sense, I do not focus on my usual way of going ahead, which Jung would correctly say it's my ego, but I become aware of something that I'm driven. What am I driven? I, and I belong to something bigger. So it's a different collective. It's a healing collective that unfortunately you did not identify. The transformation that this changes is, the transformation of Metania is fundamentally changes the whole being, their understanding of themselves and of others, of everything around them, of, uh, around them and of, the, of life itself. You grasp the fundamental nature of this transformation, but unfortunately he reduced it to second half of life and turning from the collective to the individual, which is not entirely wrong, but 
it, the way it sounds, it does not uh, include the richness of the metania that initially he used. And of course, we know that in terms of the collective view was very ambivalent or actually very negative. Um, paradoxically, he did not appropriately differentiate between the social collective, the society, with the amorphous masses. He was influenced by Gustave Le Bon, who was talking about the, uh, uh, the mass, the crowd, and all of that. And he had a polarized posi position, per perception in a rather crude way. Unlike you. In other words, there are many things that you did that are unlike you. <laughs> um, so the individual is good, the collective is bad in a blanket way. No, he had no positive appreciation of the healing power of the collective support and relatedness. Relatedness. Yet, of course, he praised the exotic collective rituals of the primitives. But for us, the fallen people, uh, there is no uh, uh, healing of the collective. As you may know, I have also uh, made another distinction of two Jungs when we're talking about Jungian approach, which Jung? And I, I called the one Socratic ignorance that Socrat Socrates was saying, I don't know what is, I don't know. Um, I, what, the only thing I know is that I don't know, which means that I open up the investigation. Um, and then also the Gnostic knowledge, which is a closed epistemology. I know I disagree with a lot of my uh, dear Jungian friends here, but the Jung Gnostic uh, uh, epistemology of Jung for me is very problematic. Listen, when Jung is open epistemologically, he's saying even one who has great experience in these matters, one is again and again obliged before each dream to admit one's ignorance and renouncing all preconceived ideas to prepare for something entirely unexpected. Openness, openness. Let's engage with each other and see how, what we can create. That is the essence of the alchemical approach, as opposed to the Gnostic, that I know what is happening, nothing but that he was ridiculing Freud that he was following and nothing but psychology. And he is to all the causal, the reducting, uh, causal reductive explanations, scornfully and beautifully. <laughs> Jung was amazing in doing that. And he's talking about the theory and practice of trauma according to Freud. And he says, it is delightfully simple, delightfully simple. I love his, these quips that Jung has occasionally, delightfully simple. In other words, you have an external event, people have trauma, and then you are reactive and everything is fine. Delightfully simple. He's attacking that. He's attacking that. So I'm interested in Jung's epistemological insightfulness. And I keep on insisting there, and I regret that there is not much writing within the Jungian scholars about his epistemology because he was emphasizing the psychological implications, the, the impact of belief in spirits, religion, political movements, etc. And there it was a lot of misunderstanding. For example, with his, doc with his own doctoral dissertation, he's talking about uh, spiritualism, people believing in spirits. You did, ne did not say, I believe in spirits or I don't believe in spirits. He said, what are the psychological implications of a person who believes in spirits? Now, that's an incredibly sophisticated epistemological and methodological position. And of course, Jungians, some are for spirits or against, and, and they miss the point. But of course, um, this psychologization that he's, that, sorry, the, this focus on the psychological dimension is important but also can lead to psychologization, which means that you use exclusively psychological means to understand complex phenomena that are not exclusively psychological. For example, political phenomena, like when we say Saddam Hussein is the archetype of evil. No, he's not the archetype of evil. He's 
he, he belongs to a certain sociopolitical and historical and economic context. And if we don't understand that, saying whether he's the archetype of evil or not is of no relevance. We are confusing the issue. It's wrong, it's inappropriate psychologization. So my, I keep on repeating that for me, uh, Jung remains one of the main pioneers in venturing into exploring the epistemological dimensions of therapeutic approaches, and not many people have ventured into that. And I think there is still a lot to be extracted from that. He went beyond the traditional distinction between clinical and theoretical. And uh, um, to give you another example, here is something else that not, doesn't mention at all Jung, um, the adversity grid that I developed over the years in the field of uh, working with refugees and uh, all other survivors of severe forms of collective adversity. And uh, um, I will show you again that without using the word Jung um, or waving any Jungian flag, um, this is embedded and inspired by Jung and taking further his Jungian approach. Basically, what I'm saying is that anybody who is exposed to adversity uh, inevitably um, experiences some negative effects. But also there are some unchanged effects in people, as well as there are some positive gains from being exposed to adversity, which are called adversity activated development. And that can be seen at different levels, individual, family, etc., etc. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, that's not my aim. But in, it's in order to show you that Jung actually was uh, key to this is a distinction between distress and disorder. Distress is the normal response to abnormal circumstances. And Jung said thousands of, of times in different ways, suffering is not an illness. Suffering is not an illness. Suffering is not an illness. It is a normal counterpole of happiness. How many Jungians who are working in the field of trauma nowadays take that seriously? Any discomfort or suffering we consider is a trauma and pathology and illness. No, that's really sad. Can we try to follow what Jung is saying? Um, of course, it, 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 there is a we need to make a, a distinction between distress and disorder, which the greed makes. And disorder is abnormal responses to abnormal circumstances. And here is also what I call the teleological metania. In addition to causality, of course there is causality, or everywhere. If you don't pay your uh, debt in your bank, they're going to possess your car. Um, very clear. There is no two ways about it. But in addition to causality, there is the function of the symptom. Adversity stretches people. By definition, adversity means against the term. I don't expect it. So I respond in a new way. I activate new ways of dealing with it. And if I, have, if I become aware of those and of new, these new responses and can use them, they can develop further. This is the substantial transformation that can take place as a result of being exposed to adversity. People say, doctor, because I came so close to death, now I see life differently. Instead, we're looking there to treat their trauma and stop this symptom and stop that symptom. And yet if we listen, everybody will say variations of what I just said. Because I came so close to death, I experienced this amazing uh, uh, form of collective form of adversity. Now I, I, I am confused because I see things different. I cannot carry on with my life as in, in the normal way. There is a teleological metania in front of us. Do we become aware of it? Do we value it? Do we use it? Or do we go back into variations of psychoanalytic and other sort of uh, uh, methods of, uh, of fixing people because now they are not functioning well and, and our aim is simply to repair them from their trauma? What a pity. 
and Jung is showing the way. So is developing this new epistemology, viewing ourselves and others around us in a new way to reconceptualize virtually everything. Let us not forget another word that is used very widely today is well-being. And of course, well-being, nobody, you know, everybody's talking about well-being, well-being, well-being. You know, why? Because they, 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 they are a little bit uncomfortable using the old fashioned word normal. So what is normal and what is abnormal? Now we are all promoting well-being. But of course, Jung was aware of these things, although not of this particular thing. This is my you know, understanding of that. We need to go back to Aristotle, who differentiated two types of well-being. And I would argue that um, uh, the two, the hedonic and the eudaimonic well-being. The, look at it, the majority of these humanitarian approaches to helping people essentially are hedonic well-being, following the hedonic understanding of the world, avoidance of suffering and pursued, uh, pursuing happiness and pleasure. Whereas the eudaimonic is to actualize one's potential, to follow one's demon. In ancient Greek, demon is not demonic uh, like devil, but the God, uh, the God within actualizing one's potential, living according to one's unique nature, uh, acquiring a sense of fulfillment. What is more Jungian than that? How many Jungians are following this incredible new understanding of the eudaimonic understanding of well-being? There is a lot of fruitful material there. I'm closing. I'm going to read what Herbert Reed wrote about Jung. Um, nobody saw the significance, um, the significance of the rise of Nazism as clearly as Jung. Nobody gave such clear warnings. His voice was ignored and afterwards his clear understanding of the situation was misconstrued as a sympathetic attitude towards it. The physician must be the carrier of the disease he would cure. The prophet must be stoned for daring to prophesy war and pestilence. This is typical writings and adulation of a prophet. Please, we do not need Jung to be like that. This is disservice to Jung. For me, it is an insult that somebody writes like this. Writes like this. Nobody saw the significance of the rise of Nazism as clear as you. Come on, come on. Come on. Nobody gave such clear warnings. Come on. Why, 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 this, why this adulation? Why this? Why? That's the service. Jung doesn't need that. Jung needs straightforward people who are going to look at his pointed direction rather than adore his pointing finger. In my, in my, in my dissertation, um, paraphrasing Alan Watts, um, back in, in the 70s, I wrote, it is rather unfortunate that after a great man's death, his followers tend to stare in adoration at his pointing finger rather than trace the implications of the pointed direction. And I'm afraid there is a lot of that happening now. People put garlands on the, on the pointed finger, they put incense in front, they bow down, they, they sacrifice uh, instead of looking at the pointed direction. I end with Jung's words, who said to Freud, one repays a teacher badly if one remains only a pupil. And I look forward that these Jung lectures and what we offer at the University of Essex, but in general, promote further the Jungian scholarship. And through these uh, lectures, we hear many more people um, uh, so that we can all learn and deepen our understanding with the or dignity that, de that Jung deserves and not with this inappropriate adulation that is embarrassingly nauseating. Thank you very much. And I look forward to engaging with you with uh, uh, um, um, any of your questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Ronas. That was uh, wonderful, uh, wonderfully rich. Um, dare I say it, it was a kind of um, greatest hits. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you covered all the bases. Fantastic. <laughs> um that's wonderful uh uh so yeah i mean let's let's uh, I, I invite uh, anyone or uh, amongst you to to ask a question or make a comment or anything at all um let's just look at the chat um yes people can write on the chat but i would prefer if they would uh, speak with me directly uh, and engage as much as we can. Thank you. Intentionally, I try to limit it so that we have um, at least uh, 20 minutes um, discussion. Indeed. Um, so any points of clarification or comments or questions, I look forward to engaging with you. Thank you. Yes, I mean, John Kent is asking if it's possible to get a copy of the PowerPoint slides. Um, and then uh, will be on, uh, on yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there is okay. somebody, Jonathan. Uh, yes, uh, well, just before I go to Jonathan, um, Murray has uh, put in the, in the chat, uh, given the question. Uh, Murray, do you want to ask this yourself? Sure. Um, Renus, you made the point that Jung was rather down on collectives and emphasized the individual. <clears throat> uh, and you spoke about the healing power of the collectives. Where do you see that today? Anywhere? What is the healing power of the collective? <laughs> what is the healing power of the rituals that Jung is exalting? Um, uh, he's talking about the primitives, the primitives. He's don't talking have, about the yeah. primitives, but I'm talking about us today. Where is it today? Where do you see it today? Have you never been in any community meetings where they have uh, caring, uh, supportive uh, uh, um, uh, movements? I, I am part of many of these, from environmental to all sorts of things, and where people can actually um, um, uh, be supported, uh, feel the tangible love and care from others. And I see a lot of changes in people, uh, both the ones who give it and those who receive it. There is a lot around in society, in addition mm -hmm. to the alienation and, the, and the, all the bad things that Jung is talking about. And, the, and the, uh, 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 of course, there is a lot of mindless following collective recipes, like, uh, I don't know, um, I don't want to use um, your country you know, <laughs> with political movements and like that. But uh, there are a lot of community, um, healing communities, and I'm, I'm, I'm part of many. Yeah, well, I hope you're right, because what we see mostly is people kind of locked into what Jung called mass mindedness, and they go to rallies and, and they yeah. feel that they're very supported in their very one-sided political opinions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we know that that exists. We know, we know that that exists, but yeah. also what I'm saying also exists. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mari. Um, Jonathan, uh, do you want to ask a question? Uh, yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the lecture, Dr. Papadopoulos, uh, it was very insightful. Um, you mentioned uh, that, you know, within at least, maybe I misunderstood you, so correct me if, if I did, um, you mentioned that within sort of, I guess, at least the concerns of Jung in the academy, the sort of Gnostic Jung with a more kind of closed epistemolo epistemology is less helpful. And I'm wondering, um, you know, whether you can see or, or where you see the sort of positives of that, uh, that part of Jung's opus in terms of, you know, maybe outside of the academy or, or where it could be integrated in clinical work, uh, in other aspects, in other sort of realms of thinking or being I, I, i'm not sure what your question is is uh, and you know I mean his interest in is in gnosticism or uh, or the gnostic epistemology because these are two different things okay yeah so i guess if you could clarify maybe the distinction then that would be helpful right well i mean what i'm talking about gnostic epistemology is that um, um i make a very sharp distinction between the alchemical epistemology and the gnostic epistemology in the, in the, in the alchemical is that you and I get together and a third um, something will appear 
which we cannot predict, very much like uh, uh, Socrates, who was saying, you know, I don't know. Um, they go and ask him uh, what is virtue, or I don't know what is virtue. Uh, Socrates says, let's engage, you know, wh why are you asking this, etc. And in the interaction, something emerges. Whereas the Gnostic epistemology, there is something very clear that the initiate knows and uh, needs to part on to you. Um, so there is no openness. And of course, there is elitism there. And there are many abuses uh, in the antiquity of uh, Gnosticism and even today. So um, uh, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not, I wasn't saying that that is in the um, academy. I didn't connect it with the academy today at all. Um, but yes, some academics are, tend to become more Gnostic or more alchemical. It depends on, on them. But uh, this is what I was referring to, a closed system which is uh, like uh, Jung is uh, mocking uh, Freud and is saying is delightfully simple. It's so nice to say, you know, there is an external event, creates a problem, and then, you know, you, you are react and that's fine, that's fine, he's saying to him. That is Gnostic epistemology, very close. Uh, I, people, the expert knows, knows the answer. Whereas for whereas the uh, the whereas within the alchemy, the expert knows the procedure, not the answer, and that's why you get a lot of different analysts. Analysts who go there and they you know um, can tell you exactly what you should be doing in your life, whether you you know, uh, or others who sort of say I don't know you know your life. You are more expert in your life. I'm here to help you um, develop. Um, uh, a deeper understanding rather than me telling you, yes, you should leave your wife or your husband or whatever, uh, or you should uh, study this or you should study that. And Jung was, Jung was doing both. This is my point. And he was not aware of that. Hmm. This is my argument. Sometimes you read Jung and he's terribly agnostic, very prescriptive, knows everything. And another one, um, um, he says, no, I know nothing. I'm just uh, investigating. Archetype, change it, man. No problem for me. Just find something more relevant. I love that Jung. I don't relate very much to the other Jung. But I know a lot of other Jungians, and especially if you want to have a, a system and a mausoleum and all of that, you, people need to have some certainties. I love his uncertainty. His conviction in his, of his uncertainty. His, 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 his confidence in being uncertain and trusting that that uncertainty will lead to something constructive. That's teleology in the making, in happening. Otherwise, you know, usually we have these sort of slogans, yes, oh, Freudians are, are deterministic and Jungians are uh, uh, teleological. But in what way are they teleological? either theoretically or clinically. I've seen very little evidence of actual documentation of teleology in practice. It's just slogans by and large. And I say, what a pity. Thank you. Thank you. Calypso, uh, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I do. Hi. So my question is that I have been doing a little bit of research on various aspects, oh, various aspects, and I've realized that a lot of the research that is done nowadays is going more towards political views. And my question is, why is this happening? I was looking for something related to education, and there's not a lot of it. Uh, relating to Jungian uh, things, it's more going to the political side. So I'm wondering why do the Jungian community is going more towards that way? I don't know. Uh, you must ask those who do it. I don't know. I cannot ask. <laughs> I, I cannot ask. I don't know. Okay, sorry. Right. Thank you. That is, if that is your impression, um, I don't know. I mean, um, um, I don't know. Um, 
I mean, um, I've been working with governments. I've been working with, uh, you know, um, I, yeah, I, I don't want to go into that. I, I mean, uh, it's, uh, I, I don't, I don't understand exactly what you mean by that. Uh, there is emphasis on the political and uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, Okay, um, uh, Kathy Madden has, has asked, how further can we activate the concept of metanoia in both clinical and academic and life setting, settings? I think, I think, thank you, a very good question. I think, first of all, it's important to, 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 uh, to study that more and try to see, I think there is a lot of fruitful application but first we need to understand it deeper and, uh, and study a little bit more that. But essentially it is that kind of transformation that changes, well, I suppose you, using Jungian terminology, it, it, it clicks from the ego perspective to a self perspective. Um, that is what Jung really was referring to. Um, I'm putting words in his mouth, but I think he would have approved of what I'm saying. Um, it's that kind of transformation, the clicking from the one to the other. And uh, I think that there is uh, um, a lot that we can learn from that. Um, but I love the idea of Teshuvah uh, because you don't carry on work, but you turn back, you turn back and you realize something that was happening and you are not aware of in this particular context is that God has been calling you. It's that, that's the language. Um, you need to translate it in your own language. Um, in other words, what is it that has been happening and we have not been aware of? And by becoming aware of, we change the way we see ourselves, our own goals, our own understanding of ourselves, etc. And then, a person can, I mean, I can tell you, I mean, I, I, I work with people who, you know, have been tortured, uh, who have been refugees, who have been uh, uh, trafficked and uh, et cetera, all over the world for 40 years in 40 different countries. Um, and I hear a lot of this from people that after these extreme experiences of adversity, um, they inevitably, they see things differently. And they, they almost stop themselves and say, what have I been doing? It's that kind of teshuva. They turn back and they say, who am I? Why was I going this way? Why should I waste my time learn, earning more and more money and not uh, spending time with my wife and children? Why don't I spend more time looking at the sun and valuing nature? These transformations are substantial if we allow them to be heard in our exchange with people in this nature, if we're there to repair their damagedness from being traumatized, we'll never see anything. We see ourselves just as repair people, like a, like a garage mechanic. And most of psychology today um, is just uh, training car garage mechanics to fix cars or to fix people from their discomfort and, uh, and, and suffering. And Jung is saying, suffering is not an illness. Suffering is not an illness. And said, people cannot develop if they do not even uh, uh, deal, you know, accept their own measure of suffering, etc. I mean, Jung has amazing insights in relation to that. Um, what a pity that we reduce it into superficial techniques and, um, we miss this richness. Thank you. Thank you, Renos. Uh, Christiana. You're, you're on mute. Hi, sorry about that. Uh, it's just a small comment. Uh, what I'm keeping from your, um, let's say, lecture or presentation is what I've kept from my time in Essex when I was doing my master's degree, 
is the critical thinking and the non-dogmatic thinking. And I think it's really crucial and really important in all aspects of clinical work, of understanding society, of relating to each other. Dogma has been a real issue, especially in psychoanalytic societies and circles. And I think that it deprives us from developing and learning and understanding uh, deeper what was written. And I really liked what you said about the um, uh, dead letter, I think you mentioned, or the past letter. And we, we need things to be alive again through discourse and discussion and arguing and different opinions without being dogmatic. So just a Thank comment. This, these are not my words. This is, this are, this is what Jung, Jung's central message has been throughout. And I respect it deeply. And I lament that uh, a lot of uh, Jungians and Jungian societies ignore that. And instead they get into bickering into, as to this and that you know, about uh, who is more Jungian than other, Jungian than thou. Yeah. Right. Um, Chris. Hi, hello. Um, Renos, thanks very much for such a, a, a wide ranging um, presentation. So much going on in it. I've got lots to take away and I should be going to some texts and books and libraries to follow up on some of these ideas and concepts. Um, I, I mean, I have a couple of comments. The, the, the first one, I suppose, is, is and I, both of them will, you know, will, will sort of make links in a way between Jung and Freud, because I think what the marketplace, <clears throat> what capitalism has done to uh, both Freud and Jung is to turn it into this uh theories of outcome studies at the level of you know engagement with each patient and that to some extent has killed it and so even while it's true to say that the uh, epistemologies used in research in universities where there are therapeutic programs has moved toward the subjective and we're all we all benefit from that um who's listening <laughs> who's paying any attention to that and that is a problem that we still haven't overcome, whether it's in Jungian studies or, or, or studies of Freudian psychoanalysis. So that's a big problem for us all to get together and think about because it's unsolved. So that was the first point. And the second is to do perhaps with the comments that you're making about uh, Jung's uh, capacity to not know and to explore that area where these where these theoretical conceptualizations are marginal and ancillary and almost almost and tentative and I really love that about Jung but uh, isn't it true also of Freud now as you know I, I like to be within all of the Jungian PhD supervisions and the Freudian ones and I've joined you on many a supervisory board but isn't it the case that Freud is always saying I don't know this. Um, I can take the argument up to this this far, and then after that, I can go no further. And he's constantly doing this. And to some extent, that capacity to not know and to recognise the limitations of one's own, you know, intellect and ignorance is something that Freud and Jung really share. Um, and it's interesting that your work, as as I think Mark describes it really brilliantly, about the about the other. Because of course they found the other in each other, and that that has not ended well. But they, there's so much more in common that they have in their theoretical conceptualizations. You know, the self-regulating psyche, the return of the repressed. These are very similar conceptualizations that they're coming from a different points of view. So I suppose I want to just sort of push back a little bit, uh, and um, maybe they're connected issues because I think if the Jungians and the Freudians were a little bit more connected a little bit more in discourse, we would apply ourselves to some of these social problems like the mechanization, the manualization of very deep therapeutic engagement, um, which is destroyed um, uh, currently, you know, being destroyed currently. Um, so I guess they're, they're linked questions in a way, but but yeah. let's, you know, perhaps there's some reflections on those those comments. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. And you are absolutely right. The difficulty, of course, with uh, within the Jungian camp, so to speak, is that um, by and large, they understand Freud according to Jung's own writings of Freud, which basically he was not aware of Freud after they, you know, after 1913. Um, and uh, the majority of Jungians are not aware of this limitation. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, um, like, uh, <laughs> it's a kind of a social phenomenon. Everybody who wants to develop something wants to say how disadvantaged it is. And, and, and the other one is more uh, advantage, uh, more advantage than the Jungians uh, like to say, um, you know, the Freudians uh, have it better and we are really ignored once, et cetera, et cetera. But you are absolutely right. Um, there are a lot of uh, incredible similarities and uh, I'm, I'm delighted that within our department, there are these comparative uh, discussions, not only with Freud and Jung, but uh, you know, with uh, Lacan and with uh, uh, Bion and, and, so, and Klein and so many other people to understand the, uh, the commonalities between uh, psychoanalytic discourses. Um, the, uh, I really hope that this kind of, um, uh, I don't know, like football or uh, divisions or like political divisions, this side right, uh, needs, to, needs to stop and, and we need to move forward together. Yeah, I agree with you totally. Yeah. Good. Um, I noticed Kathy Madden in the chat um, supporting the idea that your your dissertation really should be published, Ronos. Um, and I'm I'm certainly um, along alongside her in that. Um, uh, yes, um, is um, Ant Antia? Would that be your the way to pronounce your name? Yes, well pronounced. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to mention something uh, briefly. But I think um, if uh, authors like Freud and Jung uh, write. Um, <laughs> that they have no idea and that they accept that they have no idea or they come to points where they don't, don't get further. This is one thing, but the other thing is always how they behave towards their critics. Um, and as we know, both Jung and Freud had not been too pleasant <laughs> to people who criticize their concepts. Um, so that, that's a bit of an evidence, I think. Yeah. Well, we should not forget that these are not just simply, we are treating them now as ideas, but these, these oh. people with uh, vested interests, with lives uh, and reputations at stake. And we need to understand with empathy that uh, they were struggling with each other, et cetera, et cetera, and their followers, and they still do. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Hopefully within the academic uh, space, we can transcend those and have a, a, a much more clearer debate on the issues rather than taking all these other uh, considerations that are of relevance in other contexts, but use the uniqueness of these contexts to mm. come up with these kind of dialogues. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I agree. Great. Um, and do we have any any final questions? I mean, we, we, we're reaching the time when we were we were supposed to be ending anyway, so um, perhaps. Uh, Things are rounding off in just the right way, but uh, does anyone have a final uh, question or comment? Well, I think we should give Rainus a big round of applause. You know, right. he's a really. very important figure, um, not only in the UK, but in the international community. Um, and uh, he represents Jungian psychology, I think, in, a, in, in its best way. Um, critically, but also with appreciation um, and with uh, uh, an emphasis that Jung has a lot to offer and we need to develop it further. Uh, so I want to thank you, Reynos. You did a marvelous job uh, presenting your thoughts and uh, your spirit is very important for the Jungian world today. Thank you, Mary. It means a lot to me that you are saying that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I think you've expressed what, what many of us are feeling. So, so uh, why don't we uh, literally give give Ranos a round of applause? Oh, for thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> okay, right. Well, let's um, round that off then. Um, thank you for everybody for coming and I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, and uh, we will be, uh, as Kevin said, we will be uh, finding a way to post the recording of this at some point uh, so that uh, you'll be able to see it and indeed anyone will will be able to see it I hope, which is uh, I think uh, and, and that's something we want to do with all, all the all the lectures in in the series so um, thank you all very much and particularly thank you to Renos for a, a really wonderful talk um, Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, department. Thank you, all of you. And um, I look forward to continuing the uh, Jungian project in, in fruitful and um, creative ways, as, uh, as Jung has been telling.